Good afternoon from the University of North Georgia. My name is Zach Pilgrim and my major is Environmental and Spatial Analysis. This is year two of our project to help our town extend the tourism appeal of its main street through cultural heritage tourism. Our project location is Dahlonega, Georgia in Lumpkin County, highlighted here in yellow. Lumpkin is about an hour and a half north of Atlanta. ARC categorizes Lumpkin as a transitional county. Our project falls under ARC Goal 4 Objective D, support preservation and stewardship of community character to advance local economic growth. Our town does have unique community character. It is home to the first major gold rush in the United States in 1828 and one of the major catalysts for the Cherokee removal in 1838. Here you can see the gold plated steeple of the university's administration building built on the site of a US branch mint. Our, our primary partner is the Dahlonega Cemetery Committee, an advisory committee to city council. Mr. Chris Warwick is the committee chair and also president of the Lumpkin County Historical Society. He believes that a restored and interpreted cemetery could serve as a prime asset for the town. In the middle of town is the oldest surviving courthouse in Georgia in its original form. It's now a state historic site, the Dahlonega Gold Rush Museum. It's surrounded by a public square that's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. These past preservation efforts have drawn tourists in by the thousands every year. The tourism director at our Chamber of Commerce told us that in 2017, tourist spending corresponded to a local tax revenue of $1 million. So this part of Main Street is quite lively, but just six blocks down Main Street is the forgotten side of town. This is our project site, Mount Hope Cemetery. Mount Hope is an overlooked cultural asset, and yet cemeteries are an important part of cultural heritage tourism. These tourists tend to stay longer and spend more and they return. Next, Amelia will talk to you about our project site. Hi, my name is Amelia Arthur and I'm a senior biology major. The first known burial in Mount Hope was in 1833, the same year the town was founded on land that still belonged to the Cherokee. It is a municipal cemetery surrounded by the university. The key word here is municipal. In a municipal city cemetery, the city does not take care of the private plots. They are private property, just like your house. The city only has the responsibility to take care of the common areas, like cutting the grass or paving the roads. Here you can see how close the university and the cemetery are to each other. Mount Hope is six acres. Most of it is on terraced hillsides. Up next, Kennedy will tell you about the history of this project. Thank you, Amelia. Hi, my name is Kennedy Horn and I'm a senior studio arts major and a federal work study student here at the Appalachian Study Center. I've been involved in the Mount Hope project since 2018, before it was officially part of ATP. Initially, Mr. Warwick identified long-term challenges for Mount Hope that are obstacles to reaching its tourism potential. For last year's project, students worked on items one and two. We made a video tutorial about how to clean headstones safely, which is uploaded on YouTube. Next, we created a brochure for a walking tour in the cemetery, which is available at Dahlonega's vis visitor center. We worked with University Relations to create a video news release, which must have been shared widely because we were surprised and even a little overwhelmed with the media coverage it generated. Now this year we have had two major goals, the identif to identify unmarked graves and digitize data and photos. These two actions will go a long way to helping the cemetery committee establish a sustainability plan to, man to manage the cultural resource. Now back to Amelia. Thank you. One of the major challenges that Dahlonega has experienced is major record loss. When people purchased plots from City, Ho from City Hall, they were supposed to file the deed with the courthouse. But in 1969, arsonists destroyed City Hall. So we can't look up any records like other municipal cemeteries may be able to. Another important challenge is, co is coming to a careful consensus on how to interpret the cemetery. Whose stories have regularly been told and who has been left out? 
An anthropologist reminded us that cemeteries are active spaces of sociality where different customs and belief systems interacted over time. For example, this is a map created for the brochure using current aerial imagery. See the area that looks like an upside down pear labeled with a number five? This is the area that most people think of as the historic section. But wrapping around that is the historic African-American section on the other side of the road, number six. If we don't have many records for the section of the historic white cemetery, then we have even fewer for the enslaved people and descendants who contributed to the Lanaga history. You can see the difference in the amount of markers in each section. Our local histories have been written by white people, mostly about white people, for white people. We believe it's important to represent all of the populations in our history. For instance, many people don't know that slaveholders sent enslaved people to serve as labor in gold mines during the off agricultural season. This fall, we concentrated on locating descendant populations, particularly in relation to the historic African-American section. We wanted to learn about individual life stories as well as the larger story of contributions of people of color to our community. We are using snowball sampling to locate these descendant populations. The idea is that if you locate one person and build a relationship with that person about your project, they will tell others. Our primary gatekeeper is Ms. Green who works on campus. Here she is showing us a remembrance wall at Hickory Grove CME Church. Many of the same surnames have been found on the 1867 voter registration records, which is the first time African-American men were able to register to vote. Just as it is important to research individual lives, it's also important to understand how families were connected in the county. Tassie is now going to tell us a little more about headstones. Hi, I'm Tassie Garrett. I'm a senior here at the University of North Georgia and I'm a psychology major. Um, as part of our uh, study, we have worked in the cemetery to clean, maintain, and repair African the African American section within the Mount Hope Cemetery. Ms. Green joined us several times throughout our uh, fieldwork experience and the cedar trees that you see uh, are actually actually serve as grave markers within the cemetery. So this is a representation of us um, resetting the headstones. Throughout the project, our main goal was to reset and clean the headstones within the African American section. Uh, we have learned extensive amounts of information on different cultural traditions, um, um, pertaining to African-Americans, particularly uh, the funeral traditions. And if you want to learn more, we have an extensive literature review on that. This is a representation of a field stone. Um, and that's what it looks like when we finish our, when we finish reset, resetting the headstone. And Josh will tell us a little bit about the um, history behind Mount Hope. Hi, uh, I'm Josh Hawkins. I'm a history education major here at UNG. I'm a junior. And uh, one of the favorite things I found about Mount Hope was on the walking tour on the headstone of Isaac Rucker. I became fascinated with his story and the larger story of the U.S. colored troops. In January 1864, Isaac and his two brothers escaped from a farm in Lumpkin County, Georgia, and made their way over the North Georgia mountains to Knoxville, Tennessee. Here they joined the first colored field artillery unit and fought at a battle. Isaac remained in the Union Army and was stationed in the district of East Tennessee Freedmen's Bureau until 1868. He went home to Lumpkin County. He returned to farming and also served as an advocate for education for African-American children, representing a school, Hickory Grove CME Church. Isaac is just one of the mysteries of Mount Hope. How did Isaac and his three brothers hear about the U.S. Colored Troops? Did they see a recruitment poster like this? And where? How did they get to Knoxville? Today, that's a 177 mile journey in a car driving on the interstates from Atlanta. How did they evade the Confederate forces? Where did they get the last name Rucker? They ran away from the Austin farm. While some of the formerly enslaved individuals kept the Austin surname, these three brothers did not. Now here's Zach. But how do we weave all these bits and pieces of stories together? 
Our end goal is that anybody in the world can log on and learn about Mount Hope and that any visitors can be guided through the cemetery. We looked at these three platforms, each had advantages and disadvantages. Our final choice was to use Esri Story Maps because it's fully integrated with GIS, it has storytelling and visualization capabilities, and it has a possible expansion to mobile devices. This is a proof of concept of Corporal Isaac Rucker's grave. Esri can not only direct visitors to a specific grave and attach biographical information, it can send visitors to other headstones to learn about a particular grave symbol, a very popular topic for tours. We could also include natu natural landmarks such as the cedar trees in the African-American section. Esri will also allow us to connect to locations outside the cemetery that are related to those interred at Mount Hope. Many buildings downtown are already interpreted with a Dahlonega Stories plaque. Take Dr. Jones, for example. Next is Owen. Hello, my name is Owen Smith, and I'm a senior environmental and spatial analysis major. Our second goal is an ambitious one. Mount Hope is an active cemetery, but it's running out of space. The city could benefit from selling more plots, but only if those plots are not already occupied. Georgia Mountain Regional Commission did perform a GIS survey that pointed out empty plots in the newer sections, but not the historic ones. Here in this aerial imagery showing plots five and six, you can see what appears to be an open area with seemingly few graves. However, Upon further analysis, we can see what appears to be green rectangles oriented east to west, a typical pattern for burials. We have a hunch that these areas contain unmarked graves. We discovered a 1937 inventory that indicates the surnames for a large number of missing plots. Using the inventory, we were able to fill in about who may have been in the empty areas, as well as, shall we say, uncanny six foot long depressions in the ground. The process is not proof positive. The inventory lists many graves as unknown. It indicates surname of plot owner and not necessarily the names of the person in the grave. So this inventory only goes up to 1937. There are still a lot of graves that are missing from after this period as well. We looked at recommended methods to help in identifying these unmarked graves. Dowsing was not among the scientific methods we found, but we will come back to that later. Here is the comparison of two methods used most often. With ground penetrating radar, a push mower-like device with sensors positioned directly on the surface shoots a pulse into the ground capable of detecting disturbances in the soil. Besides excavation, ground penetrating radar is considered the most effective way to find unmarked graves. With LIDAR, a drone shoots millions of lasers down to the ground, in which are then used to develop a 3D model of the surface based off their return values. This can be further utilized to derive depressions in the ground, which will match that of a grave site. Next, Katie will go over probing. Hello, my name is Katie Bush. I'm a uh, junior digital arts major. Um, we did learn about probing. Probing was, and still is, a standard way to identify unmarked graves. This is as straightforward as it sounds. A large metal rod is pushed into the ground. It takes a bit to get used to the feel of it. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between a rock and a headstone that has been overgrown with grass. Here's an example. What appeared to be a small rock was actually four soapstone slabs that had been used as a protection over the grave of a child. From what we read in the town's newspaper, many of the graves at Mount Hope were simply mounds of dirt. Appalachians used what they had, and soapstone, a locally available resource, was abundant in North Georgia. The slot and tab tombstones are also made of uh, soapstone. We visited one of the abandoned quarries and brought home some samples. And now back to Zach. Like everyone else here, we worked in the middle of a pandemic. New students joined the project. We each had new hybrid schedules. We had to identify new consultants and research new technologies. We also have yet to come to terms with old technology we encountered. Back to dowsing. One of our community partners taught us how. He had two metal rods, and every time he placed them over the head of a grave, they would cross. I'm not going to say that I understand how this works, or even if it works, but after his demonstration, we would like to explore it more. Next year, we plan to do just this. We think it would be interesting to perform a scientific comparison of dowsing, of pseudoscience, and ground penetrating radar. Our two major goals for the spring will build our Esri story map and develop a pilot test for ground penetrating radar 
so we can report back to the partner and the community. We could not have achieved our goals without the help of all of our students, the 22 people who showed up to help with our fall cleanup, our volunteer photographers, our volunteers, our new community partner, and all of our university partners. Thank you.